Okay, this is FreeBSD at work, building network and storage infrastructure with PFSense and FreeNAS for Linux Fest 2019. All right, so my name is Connor Bay. Uh, I'm 19 years old. This is my second year at Linux Fest. I had so much fun last year, I just had to come back and try presenting this year. So back in middle school, uh, my high school and middle school IT department were kind of mm, not quite up to standards. Uh, so I got to play quite a bit with Windows Server and mess around with Active Directory and all those fun things. And I've been looking for an IT podcast at the time, and I stumbled upon TechSnap, which had just gotten going. And as we all know, Alan Jude loves to talk about FreeBSD and PFSense and FreeNAS. And I was like, wow, these are cool, and it's not Windows. Let's install this and give it a try. And I kicked out my stupid little router and my stupid little Windows SMB share box put in FreeNAS and PFSense, and then a little later down the road, I moved all my home servers uh, from Windows to FreeBSD, uh, except for one, I think, one little Ubuntu box running some Docker thingies. Okay, so let's talk about FreeBSD real quick. So FreeBSD is Unix, not Linux, Unix. It is based on the Berkeley software distribution, which was released in November of 1993. And it is, of course, open source using the FreeBSD license. So FreeBSD is a complete package. Linux is just the kernel. FreeBSD, you got your kernel, your drivers, and your user land. It's all in one package. Speaking of package, FreeBSD uses package, PKG for package management. And that's going to give you access to the FreeBSD ports collection, which has everything you could think of from X11 to Apache to games, whatever you want in there. So FreeBSD sort of got popular because of its just excellent TCP IP stack and stability. It's sort of used around the world for that. Around 50% of all the internet traffic flowing across the internet does flow through uh, FreeBSD, and that is because it's being used in CDNs or places like Netflix, which do push a lot, a lot of traffic. So FreeBSD can be found on quite a few architectures, of course, i386 and AMD64, as well as ARM, MIPS, Spark, probably a few more I'm not thinking of. So you probably already have used FreeBSD, you just might not know it. So if you've watched Netflix, the Open Connect appliances that sit in your local ISP or some regional area, that's running FreeBSD. If you've got a PS4 at home, that's running FreeBSD too. Uh, Flightware, maybe you tracked your flight out here. Flightaware is using quite a bit of FreeBSD. Uh, there was even someone who wrote into BSD Now a while back and said, I found FreeBSD code in my washing machine. <laughs> so let's talk about PFSense. So it is the world's most trusted open source firewall. Now, I don't say this, NetGate says this, but I think it's a fairly true statement. So what, what is PFSense? So it's a firewall, it's a router, it's got additional network services, DHCP, DNS, Capture Portal, maybe a VPN appliance, whatever, whatever you want. So, keeps the bad guys out, good guys in. Okay, thank you, Windows. Router, it not only does it need to get your packets where they need to go, it needs to get them there efficiently. So what I mean by network services, and I'm gonna use this term throughout, is just anything that you probably need besides a firewall and router like DHCP or maybe it's additional like traffic shaping if you've got some pesky bandwidth hogs on the network. Uh, maybe it's intrusion detection and prevention. So there are a lot of firewall and router vendors and a lot of them are, they offer decent products. Cisco, Ubiquiti, Juniper, Fortinet, a million more I'm not mentioning here. There's even more single service based appliances. Maybe just your tiny little VPN box sits on the shelf, or maybe you're running DHCP on a Windows server because it integrates so tightly with Active Directory. So PFSense is free and it's open source, and that's huge. I mean, if you're at Linux Fest, you probably like those things. So at the end of the day, it, it is FreeBSD, and you do get all the greatness that comes along with that. So the PF packet filter, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, is where, of course, PFSense gets its name from. So with that, you get Great quality of service or traffic shaping, NAT. There's a few other things in there which we can talk about. 
So let's talk use cases. So the reason I have in the, this in there because you can use that as a any or all device. So just a firewall, just a router, just a VPN appliance, just some sort of intrusion detection or prevention system, or maybe you're just using it to host your DNS server or maybe your DHCP server or running a captive portal. So the PF packet filter. So thanks to the great folks at OpenBSD, they gave us PF and it was originally released on December 1st, 2001. And it's since been ported to FreeBSD, NetBSD, DragonflyBSD, Solaris, there's probably some others in there. So when we talk about PF, it is a stateful packet filter. Most firewalls you're gonna see, especially like something maybe on, on a Windows machine or something, that's, that's a stateless firewall. So what's the difference? So stateless determines whether to block or pass traffic based on two things, the destination address and the source address. Now this information is stored in the header of each packet. It's pretty simple, okay, this is where it's going. Okay, well you can come through, no you can't. So stateful determines whether to block or pass traffic by further examining the connection itself. So it tracks the state of the connection coming across the firewall and monitors the state of the active connection and adds it to the state table. So it's significantly more advanced since it is based on context. So it is aware of the entire connection end to end. So a state table. So only packets matching a state recorded in this table are allowed to pass through the firewall. So if they're not there, well, it's just splat. So it records and monitors significantly more details than a stateless firewall, in so including the ports, protocol being used, a few other things. So the states are removed from the states table when one of two things happen. So traffic times out, such as the case maybe with UDP or some protocols do have a mechanism to terminate the connection gracefully, such as TCP when it sends a FinAC. So performance, so the <coughs> biggest impact of performance on a stateful firewall is at the beginning connection because it needs to be added to the state table. So when, you're, when you have a non-bidirectional connection like UDP, the firewall needs to wait for that to time out. So it, it may have a few things sitting in the state stable that, have, that probably shouldn't be there, but it still has to time out yet. So since only connections matching a state and firewall are allowed to pass through, you can't really just you know, boot up Nmap and just port scan whatever host BFSense is running on. And you can differentiate traffic by protocol. So maybe you've got multiple things running on one, one port. Well, I don't want to just go, OK, port, go away. I can differentiate that by protocol and go, okay, HTTP, no, you can't come across. But maybe SSH can if you're using port, I don't know, 8922 or something like that. So UDP hole punching. Let's talk about that for a minute since I see it quite a bit on forums or Reddit or something. So UDP hole punching is a method of transgressing a network uh, with NAT enabled on it. Uh, so this allows an outside host to connect to a server that they both share a connection to, and that allows them to transgress the network. So a lot of people think this is a security issue, and in some cases that is definitely true. Uh, however, it, it's used in very legitimate ways, peer-to-peer -peer traffic. When Skype used to be peer-to-peer -peer before Microsoft got their greedy little hands on it, used to do it this way. Yes, I'm bitter about Skype going down the hill. Show the state table. Let's take a peek here. So let's take a look at the columns left to right. So on the left we have the interface the protocol, the source and destination address, the current state, uh, packets in and out, and the uh, bytes in and out. Let's see if you scroll down here a little bit. So when traffic comes to the far out, it is assigned to state. So here we have on the, on the top here, since it's a TCP connection, it's time wait. And so what that means is that something's caused a slowdown in the network, and packets may arrive late, or they may arrive out of order, and this is why that state's been assigned to it. So further down the list, we have some no traffic. 
So what that means is that it's going to time out here shortly. There's no more traffic being received, and it's going to drop that state from the table. So a little bit further down the list, we see fin weight 2. And what that means, so when TCP closes the connection, it has a four-way handshake. And that means it's on step 2 of that handshake. First mention here, uh, a little bit up here, sin sent closed. That means it's uh, closed gracefully and it'll be removed here shortly. Interfaces. So there are various types of interfaces on PFSense and some of them are logical or physical. You've got the classic, okay, EM0, you're my LAN, EM1, you're my WAN. Then we, have, we of course have VLANs, bridges, think aggregation, if you want to have maybe two gigabit ports throw them together, now you've got a single two gigabit port uh, logically. And then tunneling interfaces, VPNs will create their own interfaces, GRE if you're doing site to site. Cloudflare uses GRE tunnels um, quite a bit from when you hit their servers going to whatever web server is actually behind Cloudflare. And then point to point protocol interfaces, PBPBOE is a common one used in ADSL connections, I have it at home. Uh, generic tunneling interfaces, uh, I'm not really sure exactly who or uses that. So wireless interfaces, maybe you've got a wireless radio on the back of the box. Loopback interfaces, well, 127.0.0.1, it's our favorite. So IEEE 802.1Q in 802.1Q, so the reason I put this in here is a lot of ISPs nowadays, Centrelink is an example with some of their fiber uh, to home services, you've got to be on the same VLAN. And well, what, what happens if you want to use VLANs on your, on your network? Well, you're going to run into some issues with them because they are a pain to deal with. Gateways. So gateways are a method of allowing data to access outside networks. So you may have your WAN interface, but if there's no gateway upstream somewhere, well, it's just gonna, it's not gonna go anywhere. And you can assign a static gateway, maybe your public IP address is 192.223.25.180 and your upstream is 192.223.25.254 or something. Or maybe you're getting that dynamically uh, dialing in with PPPoE, which requires username and password. So gateways are derived from the interface type. And what that means is, if you've got a static IP address, you're just going to enter it on the PFSense. It's going to stay the way. You might be receiving it dynamically through a protocol like PPPoE. So VPN gateways. VPNs are not magic. They need an existing internet connection or some connection to get to the VPN server to route their traffic through. So once they've found the, the other end, they're going to create their own little gateway and you can route traffic through that and that's going to then be encapsulated and then sent over the physical network. So authentication, some gateway types do require authentication. Again, PPPoE, username and password. Uh, some might require a token. There's quite a few out there. Some monitoring. So PFSense monitors the state of an active gateway uh, for a few things, latency and packet loss. And it probes some upstream server, and this can be configured by default, I think it's the gateway or something popular like 8.8.8.8 or something, Google's data server. And once it reaches a certain threshold, it's going to change the status, which you can see up here. So maybe I've got 10% packet loss. Well, I'm experiencing packet loss, I'm going to mark that. Well, I'm experiencing 50% packet loss. Okay, well, let's just consider this gateway offline because God help you trying to send traffic over 50% loss connection. And so that can be configured if you want to change the threshold up or down, either way. So traffic shaping, everyone's favorite. So traffic shaping is typically accomplished in two ways on PFSense, either queuing or limiting. So queuing is the most intelligent. So there's a few ways that this is done. So prioritization or deprioritization, okay, these set of hosts, they're always processed first. Well, these, well, you go to the back of the line because no one likes you. So bandwidth allocation. This is a percentage of the total bandwidth, not your line speed, your total bandwidth that you can actually push over that. So run a speed test, run 10 speed tests, take the, take the average. If you've got a 100 megabit connection, you might not be getting 100 megabits every single time. So do your tests, 
put something in there and then say, okay, 20% of that total speed, this host is always gonna have that available. And if it can't get that, start throttling other, other computers or hosts on the network. So fair queue, and I'll talk about this in a minute. It is sort of a holy grail, and I'll tell you why in a second. So limiters, uh, this is just a hard limit. So these sets of hosts, you only get 10 megabits. Maybe this other host, you get one megabit because you're an annoying IoT device and you don't need to call home all that often. Uh, so this is done uh, via the IP, local IP address. Maybe it's on a port. Uh, maybe it's even a protocol. And the way we assign these is just firewall rules. So traffic matches this firewall rule. It gets dropped into this limiter or this queue. So there are a few, uh, let's say, downsides of traffic shaping. You are going to experience uh, increased resource uh, usage, and that's going to be dependent on how much traffic shaping you're doing and how beefy your connection is. So if, you, if you're trying to do a lot of traffic shaping on a gigabit connection, yeah, your CPU usage is going to go up a bit. Maybe if it's a little one megabit connection, well, you know, like I have at home. That helped me. So it's only applicable in outbound interfaces. And this, the reason for this is because, well, it doesn't know what's on the outside. I mean, it, it, if you're using that, well, how does it know? So when you, you are doing replication and failover with PFSense, you're going to have issues because these queues are changing so much. And PFSync, uh, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, may not be able to keep up. And UPnP connections, they're not compatible with all queue types, and I'll mention that here in a minute. Let's talk about some of those queues. So the hierarchical fair service curve, this uses only bandwidth as a determining factor for what, what hosts do shape. So each interface has their own queue, and when you create a firewall rule for that, it's going to be based on each interface rather than just a whole bucket. Maybe you've got multiple sort of LAN interfaces where you're going to need to create one for each interface. So it is a bit of a pain to set up, and the reason for that uh, is mostly due to you have to test what your actual throughput is on the line. It's not your line speed what you actually get in a real-world scenario. So class-based queuing. This integrates both priority and bandwidth, and it uses the hierarchical tree to do this. So unlike HFSC, it only processes packets until the desired bandwidth limit is reached. And that's going to save you a couple CPU cycles because you're not waiting. You're not doing all this traffic shaping when you don't need to anymore. Pri-Q, this is, it's as simple as it gets. It's okay, host, you get all the priority. You're, you assign each host a, uh, a number one through seven, typically. So highest priority packets are always processed first. Uh, this is great if you have certain, just absolutely 100%, uh, just you need to have these hosts be able to have any internet they want and just put them in a Pri-Q. Every other host is gonna have to go to the back of the line if they're trying to talk on the network. So FQ coddle. So you're probably wondering why there's the holy grail in the corner. And I don't think it's a holy grail. I really don't. People wish it was. You see people on Reddit or, or forums going, oh, oh, you're having bandwidth issues. Just FQ coddle. Oh, it'll just solve all your issues. Well, it's not going to do that. So fair Q control delay. So it's a method of combating buffer bloat. And buffer bloat occurs when there's just too much other traffic on the network and things get congested. So let's say you have a latency sensitive application, maybe an online game, maybe a voice call or something, and someone's trying to watch Netflix in 4K. Well, there goes all your bandwidth. Right? Netflix doesn't need to have a few millisecond latency. It doesn't care. So OK, so let's give, give the client there maybe 10 megabits, maybe the Netflix can get the other 10 megabits to the 20 megabit connection. So it is built as a no-knob solution. Uh, no. You're going to have to play with it a little bit. And whenever you see something built as no-knobs or just, oh, just slap it on, easy peasy, be wary. 
because it's probably not going to be like that. So unlike first come first serve queues like we just talked about in the previous slide, FQCODL is intelligent. It's going to try to balance traffic on the fly. And it's much more accurate. Um, so it creates just a metric ton of queues, individual queues for each connection. Network services. So DHCP, we all love it. It's just boot up, connect to the network, and well, there's your IP address, there's your DNS servers, there's your upstream gateway. It's all there. So PFSense can do this, or it can just forward it to maybe you have DHCP running on a Windows server because DHCP typically needs to be run in the same host as Active Directory because Windows is, well, Microsoft. So DNS, authoritative and recursive name servers. Um, authoritative servers like, okay, thank you for just giving me a Windows update notification, Windows, appreciate that, uh, let's not do that. DNS forwarding, so it's exactly like D your DHCP forwarding. If the PFSense does not have that, well, just forward it to another DNS server somewhere. Uh, you can yeah. use use something like uh, Squid to do that, or not Squid. Uh, I can't remember the name of the plugin, but yes, you can do caching. And it's got it's got two different DNS forwarding systems that are built into. I can't remember what they're called. Uh, Unbound and then. Yes, Mask. Yes, that is it. Yes. Yeah. PVPO server. Well, let's say you're an ISP. Well, you got to get those uh, logins to have them go somewhere. So send them PVPO server. Dynamic DNS, so for this poor soul stuck with a public IP address. Well, you've got your dynamic DNS provider upstream somewhere sitting on the internet. You go, okay, well, my public IP was this and it just changed to this. Can you update my DNS host name to, you know, to reflect the new IP address? Captive portals, so anyone staying in a hotel tonight and they tried to hop on the Wi Fi and they had to sign in, put in room number, maybe accept some terms of service, well, that's a capture portal. And you can authenticate uh, via a variety of ways, so you can just local users and groups on the PFSense, or use something like a Radius server. Uh, free Radius is a very popular one. So VPN clients and servers. So VPN servers, OpenVPN, IPsec, L2TP, you can use your PFSense as an endpoint, have maybe you're on the road, you wanna dial in, get back on your home network. And OpenVPN makes it extremely easy on PFSense because there's a little plugin you can grab. Hit export, it'll give you a config with whatever user is selected. Just throw that OpenVPN config on your client and you're off to the races. So what I mean by VPN client on a PFSense, instead of putting individual clients on every host in your network to connect to a VPN upstream, you do it on your firewall. And, and you can do it in one of two ways. One. All traffic on the network goes to the VPN, except a few hosts, or all traffic on the network goes to the normal gateway, except a few hosts, they go to the VPN. So intrusion detection and prevention. So this is not in PFSense uh, vanilla. This is provided by one of two third-party packages, uh, Sericata and Snort. Uh, there's probably others out there. This is the only ones that I've really heard of or used. So. If you've got a pretty beefy connection, um, Snort and Suricata are roughly on par feature-wise, but Suricata is multi-threaded. And if you're doing a lot of traffic, you probably want to look into that. So this uses real-time packet analysis to detect attacks using a variety of criteria. Uh, so those methods of detection can be classified in uh, one of two ways. So signature-based. These are dictated by rule sets. So when a certain bit of traffic that comes through the firewalls matches one of those rule sets, it's either blocked or an alert is generated. Uh, so there's various rule sets you can get online. Um, just download them from some shady GitHub somewhere, maybe some shady forum. Uh, there's some really good, highly maintained public free ones, and there's a few paid ones as well. So anomaly based. So it doesn't necessarily match a rule set but traffic uh, that's in this manner is, might be a little fishy. So let's say you've got your 
I've got something that's probably never going to get traffic from uh, China. Well, oof. I don't know why some Chinese guy would be trying to get into my own cloud, but maybe we should uh, block that. Deep packet inspection. So this is used to further detect what applications are actually sending traffic over the over the connection rather than just basing it on protocol or the source and destination IP address. So this is extremely resource intensive. Uh, so if you've got a pretty beefy connection, you're going to need a pretty beefy processor for this. Dude, when you say beefy connection, are you talking about the connection to the internet? Or yeah, the, the connection. The power of the, the, of the machine running. So if you've got, like, say, a gigabit connection, yeah. maybe, a, maybe a little Atom CPU isn't the best idea. You might want to get a four core or something. Um, so, so you're really talking about the power of the, of the appliance. The yeah, power, so yeah. You're, the performance you're going to get out of PFSense is going to be based on what you're doing with it. If you try to shape a, a gigabit connection and run deep packet analysis with Snort or Siricon on it at the same time, you're going to have some pretty hefty CPU usage. So uh, when, when something is detected by Snort or Siricon, one or two things will happen. The connection will be outright blocked for a certain amount of time. Or it'll just log you and drop it into an alert. Uh, maybe it's going to alert you from something like Zabbix or something. I believe you can configure that. Um, so maybe you've got some suspicious connections, but you didn't really out outright block them because they weren't that suspicious, or they could have been legitimate. Well, I'll look at that later and decide if I really need to add a rule set that will block that traffic in the future. So DNS level ad blocking is handled by PF Blocker um, in PFSense. This is also a third-party package, but it's integrated quite well into the UI. So anyone using PyHole or have used PyHole in the past? Uh, same exact concept. So you point your DNS server at PFLocker, and when your normal DNS requests come through to google.com or reddit.com or whatever, you're going to go right through, easy peasy. But if a host is trying to make a DNS connection to you know, scummyadware.com, well, we're going to black hole that because that's an adware, and you're not even <coughs> going to get that ad that's traffic's not even going to come through the network because it was blocked. So ad blockers that run in your browser, uh, Adblock Plus, Ublock Origin, they're getting rid of the ads after the fact. So using something like PF Blocker, you're going to save a little bandwidth that way. So is that uh, less detectable by the web server? Because there's a lot of places that started detecting ad blocking. Um, yes. So... It's, it's not going to block the web server itself. Um, so when a website is running ads, it's probably not going to serve up those ads itself. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have those ads come from somewhere like Google Ad Services. And then those ads are actually going to be pulled down from the ad creator servers. Right. So yeah, there's JavaScript running in your browser yeah. pulling the ads. Yeah. And so it's gonna, instead of so the JavaScript instead of having those ads load in and then you block origin getting rid of them on your visually or it, they're not even going to be loaded at all. It's not going to download that image or video or whatever the ad is. <coughs> Monitoring. Uh, so I have a little picture of the UI here. Because everyone loves UIs. So great thing about PFSense is it's got a really nice web UI. So what I've done here is I've uh, posted a little picture of just uh, my PF sense at home on a random summer day. Um, last year, I think, actually. I can't remember when I did this. So on the, uh, on the left here, we have various information about the system. So this isn't a virtual machine, and you can absolutely virtualize PF sense. Uh, right in a, so I'm using EXSI in this case. Uh, just remember to probably pass through your network interfaces. That's the simplest way to do it. Or you can do some uh, magic with whatever kind of friends you're using to make sure PFSense has both access to the WAN, to LAN outside the hypervisor. And one really cool thing you can do if you're virtualizing PFSense is have it be the only VM that can talk to the outside world. All other VMs can only talk between themselves and the PFSense. So that means your PFSense can fire, be the firewall in front of all those VMs. So that's a, just awesome for a colo. So that's what I do. Um, I have a colo and nice little data center in Seattle. And I have my PFSense standing in front of all my VMs. So 
On the left here, we have various information about the system, my uh, resource usage, CPU usage, memory usage, disk usage. On the top here, we have various menus, system interfaces, firewalling, services, VPN status, diagnostics, help. NetGate, uh, developers of PFSense do sell profes uh, professional support, so. And then on the right, we have interfaces. So these are the interfaces I'm currently running. So my WAN, which is, so here's my uptime of that connection, my public IP address, please don't DDoS me. Uh, well, it's public anyways, so change it all the time. Um, and then right below that, we have WAN. And there's nothing there for the uh, uptime or link speed. And the reason for that is I'm using a bridge for my LAN. So I've bridged, uh, bridged together these three interfaces down here, LAN port, Kenji, AP port, and VM ports. So I put them all in a bridge and then assign that bridge to my LAN. So that means all three of those ports are going to act identical and I can, and they're all essentially one interface according to PFSense. I don't need to add firewalls for each interface when I'm trying to block something. Uh, right, right under that I have uh, gateways, uh, so I'm using WAN PPOE connection. IP address under that is my uh, PPOE server that's upstream somewhere. Uh, my latency packet loss status. Right below that I have traffic graphs, my WAN and LAN usage at the moment. Uh, there's a few other monitoring. Um, so you can offboard some of your stuff to something like Zabbix, Zabbix Agent, Nagi Yos, uh, Grafana. Everyone loves Grafana, it's really pretty Dashboards, I highly recommend you check it out if you've got any amount of servers at home or at work. Syslog servers, uh, upstream, you know, offboard that. Uh, diagnostics, iperf, top, everyone's favorite. It's top, but for PF. Ping and trace route, port scanning, uh, whatever else you can find in the ports collection. Uh, one other thing you can do with PSNs is a packet capture. So in the old days, you get your laptop and your wire sharked out and you'd mirror a port on a switch and you'd capture traffic that way. Well, just run it right from PFSense, save it as a PCAP file, uh, examine it at your leisure. Run and scene failover. So this is gonna be provided by PFSync. Uh, this synchronizes your states table, uh, your current firewall rules, any other configuration you have to another uh, PFSense network. CART, the common address redundancy protocol. Another thing given to us, I believe, by OpenBSD. So this allows uh, multiple hosts on the same LAN or subnet to share the same IP address. So if one goes down and they're synced with PFSync, traffic will just go right to the other, other host. The traffic shouldn't really even be interrupted. Uh, load balancing. So you can load balance multiple LAN connections. So you've got 100 megabit. Another 100 megabit. Well, now you've got a 200 megabit. Or you, you can fail over, say so you've got a gigabit connection, but it goes down, uh, you just fail over your 100 megabit, and you're good to go. Uh, you can also use RealAD to uh, load balance other services, web servers, uh, probably even game servers, whatever else you can think of. Uh, since it's on your edge firewall, it's going to be a lot uh, smaller footprint than, say, another service for that. Okay, Freenas, world's most popular open source storage system. Uh, once again, not my words, this is uh, for my systems, the developers. And. Yep. Oh, okay. um, uh, you were mentioning package on there. Mm -hmm. Does PFSense let you run that? Let you run package? Uh, so. Repo or do you have to be in a jail to do that? Like. So by default, it's got like a list of they call them plugins, uh, which are things that have that are tightly integrated in PFSense already, like Stored to Terracotta. They have their own uh, UI segment in the UI. It's just another little menu it'll add. Uh, but you can. Uh, change the repo to just normal, the port, normal ports collection and and pull down packages from just normal, okay, normal ports. Right that uh, yes, you, it's it is in a country file. Okay, what's that with Freenas? So I would certainly say this is true. It's extremely popular. Um, there's not a lot of, not too many open source storage systems out there. There's a lot of proprietary ones. Free as in Freenas? Well, it's free and open source. It's network fast storage. Um, share with whatever you like with iSCSI, NFS, uh, Samba, AFS, FTP. Um, you can integrate with other services in your network, Active Directory, uh, maybe LDAP, uh, cloud-based services, uh, Amazon S3, uh, maybe you're using Azure AD or something. So manage it all from a great web-based UI, just like PFSense. 
Uh, reliability. So this is provided uh, mostly by ZFS, and ZFS is pretty famous if you haven't heard about it. Uh, well, it's awesome. We'll talk about it here in a minute. It's got comprehensive monitoring uh, from the UI, and again, I'll forward it to another service like Grafana or Nagios or something. Uh, replication real-time snapshotting, uh, again, provided by ZFS. Whatever else you want to run. Uh, so spin up a FreeBSD jail, uh, spin up a VM in Beehive, my was favorite. Uh, run whatever you want in there. So Plex, transmission, maybe it's a full-blown VM. Run Windows if you want. ZFS. So the Z file system originally is Z server by This is no longer really a thing. It's now just ZFS, and that's it's not really an acronym. It's just ZFS. That's what everyone calls it. That's what it is. Uh, so originally you started development at Sun Microsystems, and uh, the source code to ZFS was released on Open Solaris in 2005. It's ported to FreeBSD in 2008. Uh, so in 2012, uh, ZFS now uses feature flags. And what this is, instead of a version uh, determining what compatibility a, a version has, so we now use feature flags. Uh, and what this is, is each feature in, in that version of ZFS has a flag attached to it. So when you try to import a pool into another machine, if the feature flags are different, you're probably not going to be able to import it, or maybe you might be able to luckily import it read-only or something. So it's a method of... Uh, determining which version without just doing version 1.2.3. whatever. So ZFS has now been ported to many operating systems, FreeBSD, NetBSD, Dragonfly BSD, ZFS and Linux, OSX, and even there's a port for Microsoft Windows coming along uh, very nicely. Open ZFS. So ZFS is a copy on write file system. And so what that means is when a block of data is written uh, to the disk, it is written to a copy instead. So after that's finished, uh, all block pointers on the disk are changed to point to that new copy. <coughs> uh, so checksumming. When data is written, a checksum of that data is also collected <coughs> and written along with the data. And when it's read back, it is compared. And you can force CFS to go through your entire, entire uh, pool and check every, every bit of data uh, against its checksum and make sure you, know, you don't have bit rot or maybe a disk sign. You don't quite know it yet. So if it does find an issue, it will try to repair that data uh, if, it's, if it's in a RAID array or something. But if it's not, it will at least alert you. Snapshotting. So snapshots are instant, and they only take up the amount of state, uh, space of data that has changed thus far. So if you only change a little bit, well, you're, it's only going to be a little bit of little small little snapshot. Boot environments. These are awesome. I, I'm sure someone screwed up an update in the past, and well, oh, my system is borked. Whenever a change to OS is made, a snapshot uh, is that made and added to the bootloader. Uh, if there are issues, the user can then just boot into the snapshot and they have a stable system once again. Uh, compression. So as data blocks are written to the disk, they are compressed automatically and decompressed when they are accessed. And so this happens at the block level, not the file level. Uh, so any applications accessing that don't really know about the compression at all and they just think it's normal. Read and write caching. So Read caching in ZFS is provided by the ARC or adaptive read cache. And if you need additional ARC space, you can add what's called an L2 ARC, which is just maybe an SSD or something. A lot of people think uh, if they're having performance issues, oh, throw an L2 ARC at it. Well, not always, because SSDs are slower than RAM. Yeah, maybe in 10 years. Uh, so a ZIL, the ZFS tent log, uh, provides write caching. So what this does is uh, this provides write caching for synchronous writes. So this might be great for something like a uh, hypervisor storage if you're providing some storage to EXSI via iSCSI or something. So ZFS is both a file system and a volume manager. So do not use hardware RAID with ZFS. You can, um, but you're going to lose out on some benefits. So what hardware RAID does is Let's say you've got a RAID 5 of four disks. Well, you're presenting that to the operating system, and all FreeNAS is going to see is one giant disk, and now you've lost all of its magic because FreeNAS and ZFS does have software RAID, and that's what allows it to be so resilient. Because when, you, when your checksum uh, and your scrub finds bad data, well, it'll just go repair that for you just real quickly if it's got some like a parity disk or something. Well, if your RAID card is just presenting that to uh, ZFS as one big disk, you can't do that. 
Uh, there's some other issues. You won't be able to see smart data probably, uh, a couple things like that. So if you want to learn more about ZFS, I highly recommend you go to uh, Alan Jude, the ZFS uh, master later on today. Data sharing. So data sets are individual file systems uh, within a ZFS pool. Uh, ZVols are block devices, and these can be used to expose a different file system to devices. Uh, common use might be just exposing a uh, ISOS drive to Windows or something. Or with EXSI or various other hypervisors, you can actually use FreeNAS as your backend storage for that. Uh, one thing I do at home is I have my FreeNAS VM running under EXSI, and all my other VMs run their storage off of FreeNAS. And so what I do is I just boot up FreeNAS as the VM first, share that iSCSI to the host, and then I delay all my other VM startup by a few seconds. And when they come online, it'll rescan, find the iSCSI drive that FreeNAS is now providing, and boot up the VMs. Uh, so permissions uh, on each of that can be any of the following. So Unix permissions, uh, Windows ACLs, OSX permissions, SMB and NFS shares, uh, method of sharing data to just about any system nowadays can be attached to individual data sets. We can also attach it multiple sharing methods to one data set. So let's say I've got one system that I'd rather use NFS on, and I've got one system that I'd rather use SMB on. Well, they can be sharing from the same data set, so I've got more than one option. Uh, you can also configure services running in jails, uh, well, a, the jail itself, to have access directly to a ZFS data set. Uh, so authentication um, to access uh, things with like SMB or something. Uh, it's LDAP, AD, RADIUS. Uh, you can even use Microsoft accounts. Integration. So with ZFS send and receive, uh, you snapshot your data and you send it over the network uh, to another ZFS system. Uh, you can use something like rsync and rclone, uh, maybe another medium. There's quite a few things, quite a few ways of transferring data nowadays. Uh, additional cloud services. So Amazon Cloud Drive and AWS S3, which I mentioned earlier. Google Drive, uh, OneDrive and Azure, um, Dropbox, Backblaze, there's all options for that. Or just HTTP key and SFTP. So maybe you've got something that's not in the cloud, but you do have a cola box on there that's just running SFTP. Well, you can just hook right into that. So REST, uh, RESTful API is a big topic nowadays. Uh, manage your freelance for that. VMware snapshots. Uh, so when you're sharing data to a EXSI host for your data storage for your VMs using ISCSI, VMware is not going to allow you to do snapshots on them, its own little VMware snapshots. So there's an option in FreeNAS uh, to handle that for you on that side. So you still get the benefits of, of that, even though VMware is big meanies. Jails. Uh, so FreeBSD Jail was first committed in 1999 uh, with the release of FreeBSD 4.0. So jails are a system of OS level virtualization. It's not Docker, it's not uh, zones, it's not a VM. So each jail shares the same kernel and there's almost no resource overhead. So due to the, due to the compartmentalized nature, uh, there's great security uh, between the jail and the host and each, each other jails. Uh, so that can be configured to increase or decrease the limitations on, on that. Uh, so the primary use of jails, uh, especially on FreeNAS, is to run other services that may not be directly runnable in FreeNAS because the jail prevents you with almost a vanilla FreeBSD environment. So uh, let's say, so Plex, huge, right? FreeNAS is running all your storage for your Plex, all your movies, TV, et cetera. Well, throw Plex into jail. Uh, make sure that jail has access to your movies data set and you're off to the races. Uh, so. FreeBSD does have its own jail management tool. However, IOCage uses a third-party one um, called IOCage. Let's talk about IOCage. Uh, sorry if it's cut off over here. It's something with the projector. Uh, so IOCage is written in Python 3 and was uh, first added to FreeNAS in version 11.1. It was in a little bit earlier, but wasn't accessible in the UI yet. Uh, FreeNAS used to use the Warden jail manager, which has since been uh, deprecated. So it's significantly easier to use. Um, especially in syntax than JL8. Uh, it's, it's your one IO cage create, uh, dash n, name of the, the VM, or sorry, jail, uh, IP4 equal blah, and you're off to the races. 
So it's typically managed via the web, uh, web UI, but CLI is also an option. This is one of the few things in Freenas that I actually prefer to use the command line for. Um, typically, you don't want to use the command line in Freenas because some changes you make won't be reflected or even saved uh, and viewable by the web UI. So IOCage supports plugins. And what an IOCage plugin is, it's this little uh, JSON file. It sits on GitHub somewhere. And it's got the name of the jail, uh, various options required for what's going to be run in the jail, packages to install, uh, and a little settings file, which has uh, additional configuration files, and then a post install shell script. So after it creates the jail, it runs this. Maybe it echoes uh, a little line to a config file. Maybe it uh, enables the service to run at boot, something like that. So a set of popular ones are offered by default, but it's pretty easy to make your own. And you can just spin up a normal uh, jail and install things manually as well. So uh, just a quick list of some of the uh, popular ones provided by default. Uh, Bacula, Couch Potato, Deluge, MB, GitLab, uh, MinOS, Spin Up Minecraft Servers, Nextcloud is very popular, Plex is very popular, uh, Transmission or Qubit Torrent uh, for your Linux ISOs downloading needs. Uh, there, there's a joke of uh, people pirating content. They're, they're not pirating, they're downloading Linux ISOs. So let's talk about Beehive. So Beehive, the BSD hypervisor, began in FreeBSD 8.1 and was added to the base system uh, well, in 10.0. Uh, so Beehive was added to FreeNAS and I believe Lim.1 as well. So Beehive is a type 2 hypervisor and simply a loadable kernel module in FreeBSD, however, it is enabled by default in FreeNAS. So uh, Beehive does have support for your most typical uh, operating systems, so FreeBSD, various Linux distros, even Windows. So if you do want to run Beehive, you are going to need some hardware with extended page tables uh, enabled. Uh, so you can uh, administrate VMs uh, via serial. There's a virtual serial connection or a graphical VNC connection, something like Windows. Uh, so in, in FreeBSD, it's normally managed by CLI. However, FreeNAS does provide a nice little web UI for that. So originally, there was a Rancher OS, uh, which is a little pre-configured Linux VM that runs Docker uh, provided. However, that's since been removed. You can still install it yourself manually if you wish. Let's take a look at the little UI here for it. Does that mean free, or free is getting native to Docker support? Or still uh, no. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe in the future that's really dependent on FreeBSD. Uh, but right now, if you're on Docker, you've got to spin up a VM, uh, some Linux VM of your choice, and just install Docker normally. Uh, so let's take a look at the UI here. Uh, memory in use, a couple of VMs. One's a, a Docker VM, one's a just normal VM. The type. Uh, virtual CP is assigned to it, memory is assigned to it, uh, current bootloader in use, one's UFI, one is using Grub. On the left here, <coughs> uh, we have some of the various menus, dashboard accounts, system, tasks, network, storage, all these just drop down to get, get you to various uh, methods of administrating the system. There is a shell if you want to just make quick adjustments uh, with the command line, just keep in mind that some things you make will not be saved and viewable in the web UI. When you said the Docker VM, you're just talking a little Docker container? Uh, no, what so, here, is it a so what, I mean, what I meant by Docker VM uh, is just a Rancher OS VM, um, because this, this picture was taken at the time when Rancher OS was just a quick option. When you create a VM in FreeNAS, you, you get the uh, option for a normal VM, just throw an ISO on it and boot off that, or a pre-configured Rancher OS VM. Maybe in the future. Who knows? A reporting and monitoring. So the web UI does provide uh, vital statistics, uh, so various information about CPU and memory usage, uh, status of the, <coughs> the ZFS pool, which we can see here on the side. I apologize, it's kind of dim on this projector. So there, this pool has, uh, is degraded, and what that means maybe a drive has died or been disconnected, something like that. And there is an alert regarding that on the right that has popped up. Various other information about the host here. So the name, it is a uh, FreeNAS mini uh, specs. Again, the menu on the left here. 
so alerts based on various criteria are generated, uh, and these can be configured. Uh, so certain alerts have various types of severity. So maybe it's just an information alert, maybe it's a critical alert. So email notifications uh, can be generated. Uh, they can be configured and sent to an email address of your choosing automatically. Uh, smart alerts uh, are sent separately, so you're gonna have to configure that uh, separately from the normal alerts generated by Freenas. So metrics can be collected uh, by various agents, Grafana, Nagios. Oh, sorry. Um, we're out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have like two. I have like two slides left. Okay. Okay. I have one or two questions. Okay. Cool. Um, so if you want to use something uh, as an alternative to Grafana, NetData is right in base system. It's pretty simple to uh, enable. So services running in jails, they're not seen by the host other than the jail itself. So if you want to monitor those, you need to put some sort of agent inside the jail. Uh, so how it all fits together. Uh, put your free NAS behind your PFSense. Everyone needs a great firewall. Um, they go together really well. Uh, so let's say you're on the road and you want to access your files. Well, put open VPN server on your PFSense remote in and grab all your files just like you're on the local end. So it's a gateway drug. Uh, it certainly got me into FreeBSD. Uh, you get your nice little shiny web UI, ease of management, and okay. All right, go ahead. Does ZFS support deduplication? Yes, and the reason I didn't mention it is because deduplication is very, it's not in quite a usable state for most things. It's usable for certain things, but it's a performance hit, a huge performance hit. Certain workloads. So ZFS has a checksum, right? Yes. So what if you use the same block twice? On, okay. So if you have like 100 VMs running on your NAS, right. that's so, 100 different like OSs, right? Uh, right. I'm saying that's 100 different volumes of the same OS you've done over and over again. Yeah, so, so it does have deduplication at the block level, but what they stress is that in most cases, it, it actually reduces performance. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you need a ton of memory. For yeah. You might think it's a good idea, memory. but it, there's very small use cases that actually excel. Like, so so it, like, do they have like a number, like gigabytes per terabyte or something? Well, what you want is to create a Gold Master VM, clone it, and those clones are uh, essentially like a snapshot of differential of that, and you get highly efficient deduplication without the potential risks of the built-in deduplication, which works with some workloads really well, but you can really shoot yourself in the foot with it. So exactly. there's an article out there on uh, I can introduce you to that. So asterisks. Yeah, and, and I highly okay. encourage you to go see Alan Jude's talk later. I'm sure he'll talk about deduplication a little bit. All right, thank you very much. Um,